we are in a series entitled The End Game. And today, I'd like to begin by sharing a story, if that's okay. It was November the 6th, 1932, when a 26-year-old young man stood in Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church. Here's a picture of that church for you to see. And he preached to the elite crowd in the nation of Germany. He preached in what was the equivalent of our national cathedral today. It was a celebration that day known as Reformation Sunday. This commemorated the work of 16th century German monk Martin Luther, who posted his 95 theses in opposition to the selling of indulgences. Basically, it was celebrating the Protestant Reformation of the church. Martin Luther lived in a day where the Catholic Church decided to tell the people that when their loved ones died, they did not go directly to heaven. They went to a place called purgatory, and they needed their sins atoned for to get out of purgatory into heaven, and if the families would give money to the church, that would purchase their atonement, their forgiveness, their cleansing. Martin Luther believed Jesus did all that on the cross, so he posted 95 reasons why he disagreed with this practice. So you fast forward near a little over 400 years, and we find in 1932, they're celebrating this pietist history, this history that was deep in the fact that they believed in the atoning work of Jesus Christ for our sins. And this Lutheran church in Germany held to the principles of the Bible. They were celebrating all of this. But on this day of celebration, Young Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the church out on the day they celebrated this great history. He preached from Revelation 2 how Jesus spoke to the church at Ephesus and said, you've lost your first love, you've fallen far, and you need to repent. This sermon met with little, if any, response. The congregation dismissed this young man and failed to repent. Three months later, Adolf Hitler became der Fuhrer the leader of Germany, which would throw the world into the Second World War in which millions would perish. Today, that cathedral is but ruins of its former glory, as you can still visit and see what happens when people reject the Word of God and the voice of the Spirit. It brings destruction. And this is just one example of what Paul said would be happening in the last days in his second letter to young Timothy. Last week we talked about the declining culture in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now we're going to move to chapter 4 and see that if there's anything more heinous than a declining culture, it's a deceptive church. Let's read together. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead, when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Some versions say sound doctrine. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Do not be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given to you. Now, we're going to see today that our culture is filled with people who have itching ears, blinded eyes, and dying souls. If some of you are ready to go home now, I can tell you're really encouraged so far. And God has taken both the ministry and the church to task and called us out for such an hour as this. I want to begin today with captioning the condition of the culture. Last week we looked at chapter 3, and in that we talked about how the woke movement in today's culture is exactly what Paul described almost to the letter when he was talking to Timothy about what would happen in the last days. Now, 
we move into chapter 4. Let's read a couple of these verses again. We're going to break it down somewhat verse by verse today. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They'll follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. With the summation of the condition of today's culture, I can tell you that we live in a culture that is completely and without restraint morally corrupt. Paul said they followed their own desires. The Greek there means lust, specifically for that which is forbidden. You ever wonder why Eve had to have the fruit from that one tree? Because it was the one tree that God said, leave alone. That's where we get forbidden fruit from. And that's the idea of following their own desires. They have the desire for that which God has forbidden. Do you know God still forbids some things? Yeah. I know we've learned a lot more about grace in the 21st century, but God still has prohibitions on some things for everybody. It's, this gives us the idea that they're passionately pursuing their fleshly desires. And it's often, most often, displayed in a culture with a liberal attitude toward and a passion for sexual pleasure. And I think we live in a culture with a liberal attitude toward and a real passion for sexual pleasure, especially for that which God has forbidden. We've seen throughout history this is not only the sign of a deteriorating culture, but Paul said it's going to mark the last days. They're going to pursue their fleshly desires. The lust of the flesh deals with fleshly appetites. The lust of the eyes deals with material gain. And the pride of life that searching to seem significant to others dominates the culture today. And Jesus said those three things are of the world. This creates an animosity toward the Word of God that would call us out in any of these areas. Paul said they will not endure wholesome and sound teaching. Again, some versions say sound doctrine. Now, the word doctrine means properly applied teaching, listen to me now, especially as it relates to lifestyle. Can I tell you, Paul was saying, Timothy, they don't mind if you preach, just don't preach close to where they're living. <laughs> I don't know how you can do that. But anyway, Paul said because of moral corruption, they're going to heap to themselves, they're going to pile on to themselves teachers who speak the words their itching ears want to hear. Now, without the language lesson, here's the, here's the uh, picture that it paints. The world is desiring to hear something pleasant. And may I say that many in the church have fallen into that same trap. They want to hear the encouragement. They want to hear what's pleasant. But not many people want to hear anything that reveals sin or challenges their morality in any way. Right. See, nothing that confronts sin will ever be comfortable for the sinner. It will always make us feel uneasy. It's called conviction. <laughs> It's designed by the love of God to draw us close to him, but it doesn't feel very pleasant. Now, he said they're going to be morally corrupt, and because of it, they're not going to want to hear sound teaching, and then that morally corrupt culture becomes spiritually confused. This is the blinded eyes part. Paul said they reject the truth and they chase after myths. The word myth there is the word lies. Can I tell you something? Anything that varies or differs with the Word of God on any subject is no more than a well-crafted lie. <laughs> I am constantly amazed at people in today's culture how they accept most any insane idea as truth. Things that are crazy sound plausible and logical. We've heard a lot in the past six or seven years of a term called fake news. Well, let me give you the real definition of fake news. Anything that contradicts the Word of God, the Bible, is fake news. Period. Period. Now, 
It's still astonishing how people seem to really believe with all of their heart the most implausible ideas. They give all of their heart to satanic propaganda that props up a corrupt culture. They're spiritually confused, and they're morally corrupt, and they're in danger of being, here we go, eternally condemned. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul was writing to them about the coming of the Lord. He seemed to get on that subject quite a few times. He talked about the rise of the evil one in the earth, the Antichrist. And he begins to speak to the fate of the morally corrupt and the spiritually confused. Watch this. He talks about how Satan will use every kind of evil deception to fool all the people because they refuse to love and accept the truth. Now watch this. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Listen to me. I believe we are in that part in the culture right now where God has allowed people because of their constant rejection of the truth, their constant rejection of Jesus, he has allowed them to live or, or to grow in their own deception, to truly believe what they say they believe even though there's no truth as basis. I see it all the time. I see clips of street preachers who are trying to preach the gospel and people yelling and screaming at them. We don't want to hear what you've got to say. There's nothing to it. We are literally now living in a culture that believes the lie to be the truth. And they are eternally judged, the Bible says, because they enjoy evil and reject truth. There you have it. Itching ears, blinded eyes and dying souls. That is the culture in which we live today. If I stopped the message here, we would all go home depressed. We would all go home feeling disheartened. We would all leave here thinking, why don't we even go to church? Why don't we just turn it into a bar? Maybe at least people can drown their sorrows then. Well, listen, if you're willing to write off everybody in the culture, and just say they're all going to hell in the proverbial handbasket, then the, the, the community might be better off with a bar because there's going to be a lot of depression. They're going to need to medicate. But if you believe that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world and the answer for the culture, then don't, 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 don't bring in the trucks just yet. Don't take out the pews and start putting in the dancing girls. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Don't start shutting the doors and staying home from church because in this dark world, Jesus placed a light. In this hopeless world, he placed a people of hope. And that is exactly where I see in this passage the charge to the church. Listen, there is one entity of established in the earth by Jesus Christ as the agent of redemption for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord. And that entity, my friend, is the church, you and me and all who believe in and follow Jesus. We can write off a condemned culture and tell them to self-medicate their problems, or we can bring the solution. Wow. The first thing I draw from Paul's words to Timothy as he begins to charge the church is this. We are to live with concern. Let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 4. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. Now, wait just a minute. I could preach a whole sermon on this solemnly urge you thing. It's as if the preacher's standing before the young man and young woman, and he says, I charge you in the presence of God in these witnesses. I think I'm doing a wedding this weekend, and I'm going to get those two people, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> they're going to be sweat beads rolling off their foreheads when I get done with that charge from the Holy Spirit that you're doing this in the sight of God and these witnesses. That's kind of the idea that Paul is giving right here. He's saying, I solemnly urge you. In other words, this ain't any, I'm, I'm not playing about this, Timothy. This is not something you can forget easily or just lay aside. There is an urgency that I'm coming to you with to say you've got to remember this and you've got to live with this concern. I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus.
Jesus who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Now, there are three things he says that's going to happen. First of all, he says Jesus is coming. How many of you still believe that Jesus is coming? As a matter of fact, I'm excited about the fact that Jesus is coming. And for everybody who knows Jesus, that's going to be a glorious day. That's going to be a wonderful day. Following the rapture of the church and the time of tribulation here on the earth, Jesus will come back and set up his kingdom, and he will rule for a great period of time in the earth. And he's telling us, Jesus is coming back. He's going to establish his kingdom, but there are people that are going to face his judgment. He's going to judge the living and the dead. And the standard of that judgment will be whether or not people have accepted him as Lord and Savior of their life. And what he's telling Timothy is, you can look forward as a believer to the coming of Jesus Christ, but don't forget there are some people who still don't know Jesus, and that's not going to be a great day. That's going to be a horrible day. That's going to be a terrible day because they're going to be judged for all eternity and cast from the presence of God forever. Listen, every believer in Jesus Christ should rejoice in your salvation. You should find joy in the fact that you've been forgiven by the grace of God, but at the same time, you should be moved in the deepest part of your soul because there are people who are still lost and undone without God. And as long as there's one lost person in Nashville, Tennessee, this church still has work to do. You still have work to do. I still have work to do. It's all because of Jesus, and everyone needs Jesus. Live, live, live with this concern for the lost. Secondly, It's where he challenges the pulpit, I believe. And that is, we are to preach with conviction. Watch this, verse 2. Preach the Word of God, not from the tenets of your latest book that you've written, not from some self-help book, not seven simple steps to salvation and security. Preach the Word. Preach the Word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Wow. The word preach is the Greek word caruso, which means to publicly proclaim a message with deep conviction. The word for word is the Greek word logos, which simply means divine utterance. So the idea of preaching the Word of God is to be the mouthpiece of God, to speak to others what God is speaking. That you're not the author of the sermon or the message, you're just the conduit through which God is speaking. Hear me now. It is to preach the gospel as the authoritative word of God, listen, bringing eternal accountability to everyone who hears it. That's why it is so important that ministers of the gospel that are in the pulpits of America get alone with God before they get before their people. You hear me? That's why the Lord moved me to take my study time to my home office so I could get away from everybody else and get alone with him. Because as long as I'm listening to every other voice, I may not hear the voice we need to hear. That's why it's important that every minister pay a price in prayer and in study and in preparation because people don't need to hear another word from you. They need to hear a word from God. Can I get a witness from somebody? (laughs) Ministers like me cannot shirk the responsibility or shrink from the task God has given us to preach the truth of God's Word, and we must do so without an apology and without insecurity. Hear me. He said, notice, you preach the word whether the time is favorable or not. The Scripture says in other versions, in season, be instant, in season, out of season. In the original language, I do not believe there's a conjunction. I believe it was placed there for other people's understanding, but I believe it says this. Timothy, if sound teaching, if biblical truth, if sound doctrine is out of season in the culture, Let it never be out of season in your pulpit. Church, if sound doctrine is out of season in the culture, it is in season in the church. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? 
it, we, we are not going to let a world who does not know God tell us about God. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It, it is, it, I, I realize that preaching the truth of God's Word is not always popular in today's culture, but I've learned something. You can't preach for popularity, and you can't teach for a tithe check. You've got to be obedient and speak the divine utterance of God with great conviction without intimidation because God at the end of the way will hold every person accountable who carried the who carried as a man of the cloth the word of God every man and woman who shares his word will face responsibility for that and you know what I've learned I'm more concerned with what he says at the end of the way than what you say along the way because I have to be obedient to him and that's what he's telling Timothy remember People, even within the church, have itching ears, only wanting to hear what is positive, what is encouraging, what is pleasant. But the very language Paul uses in talking to Timothy says it's not going to be like that. Okay? Let me read you a few words. He said, too patiently, so we see there's an attitude in which we are to teach and preach, not as lords over God's heritage, not as impatient with people who just don't get it, but to have the patience of God wanting all to come to repentance. He says, patiently correct. The Greek word means to expose, to show to be guilty. <laughs> See, you thought there wasn't that much to preach in, didn't you? To expose as guilty. Not to sit around and soft-step issues that are hot buttons in the culture for fear of offending people. But to preach and patiently correct. The next word is rebuke, which means to admonish, to warn, or to keep something from going wrong. The third word is encourage, perikaleo, which means to call, to invite, to make a call from being close up and personal. And from that close up and personal experience, you invite people to walk in the right way. So he says, expose the sin as guilty. And then correct them, rebuke them, and say, you need to quit going that way. And then the encouragement part is, you need to start going that way. What he's telling Timothy is to preach with the response or the result of repentance in mind. I'm just going to lay it on. I don't know if I'm going to get out of here on time today, but I'm going to lay it on the line right here. There's too many preachers preaching for the amens. There's too many preachers preaching to stir up a shout in their congregation because nobody feels like they've been to church unless they've had a little shout. You know why I know when I've been to church, when I get in the presence of God and I feel his holiness and righteousness and the word of God convicts me of my sin and I realize like Isaiah, I'm unclean and I dwell among a people of unclean lips and I cry out for a cleansing. That's how I know I've been in his presence because I've been exposed to his holiness. It's revealed my sinfulness and I have decided in that moment to turn turn from something and turn to him. That's when you've really been to church. That's when you've really experienced God, when it makes a change in your life. There's a lot of people who shout on Sunday and live like the devil on Monday. They sing the loudest. They clap the hardest. But when the preaching comes, they got their AirPods in. Their spiritual fingers are in their ears. Listen, if there's anything between my soul and the Savior, I pray that whoever's doing the preaching that Sunday will have heard from God and God loves me enough to reveal it so I can get rid of it. I appreciate those three people who agree with that. I really do. It's interesting. The word parakaleo is very, very similar to the word paraclete or parakletos, which is what we use to describe the Holy Spirit in the Greek. God sent the Holy Spirit not to stand above us and judge us, but to come alongside and help us. And I believe here's what he's telling Timothy. Timothy, don't stand in your self-righteous seat of judgment and condemn everybody, but get down and walk with them and lead them each day in the way they're supposed to go. See, we can't reach people we're not willing to walk with. 
We can't reach people we're willing to look down on and forget that we too ourselves are nothing but sinners that God gloriously saved by his grace and we need the same grace they need. So here's the thing. You can't help anybody. You can't rebuke, encourage, or correct anybody you're not willing to invest in. If you're not willing to come along beside them and be a friend when they need a friend, come on now, somebody, to love them when nobody else loves them, if you're not willing to do for them what other people will not do for them, there's no way that you can be a part of that. But he tells Timothy, you keep remembering, your, your, your word is going to, my word is going to confront people, Timothy, but I want you to love them so much that you're willing to walk with them each day and invest in them as people. You know why? That, that, that's why great greeters are important in a church. Smiling people, shaking hands, hugging necks, and loving people. The reason is, when they come in, if the true word of God's being preached, it's going to confront all of our lives. So we need somebody to break up the fallow ground of their heart by loving them and welcoming them so when they come in and the gospel confronts them, it will be done in an atmosphere of love. Then the Bible says when the truth is preached in love, it builds up, it doesn't tear down. So I want to say thank you to all of those greeters who stand out there every Sunday and love on people because when they come in this house, they're going to hear the Word of God and it's going to confront our lives. Wow. Yes, the Word of God confronts as well as encourages, but the culture is hanging in the balance, and the silence in the American pulpit is deafening. I want to read to you the words of Charles G. Finney, great preacher in the faith, many, many years ago, as he was speaking to others who carried the Word. He said, brethren, our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. If immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours to a great degree. Now listen, if there's a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, <laughs> the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. Let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in the respects to the morals of this nation. Hear me. Everything that man said many years ago has come to pass in America, and the pulpit is responsible for it. People who have <laughs> yielded responsibility to intimidation, pastors who've been afraid of personalities, Ministers who've been afraid of being canceled are truthfully ministers that just want the money to keep rolling in so they don't say anything to hurt anybody's feelings. Let me tell you something. I don't preach to hurt people's feelings. That's not my goal. But I can tell you that if you're on the wrong side of truth, sometimes it's going to rub you the wrong way. But it must be done out of a passion of a man or woman's heart for God and for people who are lost and dying and need Jesus. And I will make this commitment to you. As long as God gives me breath, I will never be an ear tickler. I will always be a voice and a mouthpiece for the word of the Lord because it must be heard. And let me say something not in the notes. You younger guys that are coming up behind me that I'm, that I'm privileged to love and to share this with and to teach in, don't you ever make the mistake of preaching to be popular and don't you ever be afraid of what somebody's going to say. Get along with God and have more fear of the Lord than you do of man when you get in the pulpit. Preach the truth and let the truth set people free because people are in bondage today and the only thing that breaks the bondage is the anointed word of the Holy Spirit. Oh, man, I told you I ain't going to get it finished. Wow. The voice of the Lord must be heard. The word of the Lord is the only hope for a corrupt and condemned culture. The third thing he tells Timothy to do this is to minister with courage. What's this? But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God's given you. 
Paul was telling Timothy that preaching the truth comes with a cost. But he tells him to remain sober-minded. Hear me. Don't be rattled by resistance. When the truth is on your side and when God is for you, it don't matter who's against you. I am praying for every person charged with the care of America's pulpits to have the courage to preach the truth in love no matter what the climate or the cost. But I'm also praying for every Christian to do the very same thing in our everyday lives. See, Paul tells, the Tim tells Timothy not only to instruct the church, but to work at telling others the good news about Jesus. In the King James Version, he says, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. The term evangelist was given to anyone in the Scripture that was not an apostle who carried the message of Jesus. Timothy was a pastor, yet Paul says, be an evangelist. What's that telling me? That's telling me that, re that evangelism is not a program within the church. Evangelism is the call to every blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ. Every person that's joining us online, every person that's in this room, the call of God is upon your life to share the love of Jesus and share the message of Jesus with everyone that you meet. But why? Because Paul told, or Paul told Timothy what he's telling us, Jesus is coming. He's going to judge the living and the dead, and he's going to establish his kingdom. And the question is, who's going to be a part of that kingdom? Everyone who has heard and accepted the gospel as truth and committed their life to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. See, I tell you, every single one of us is called to share Jesus with whomever we come in contact with, and it's not something we can play with anymore. We don't have time to be complacent. The real ministry doesn't happen right inside of these walls. The real work of the church begins when you walk out of the doors today. I will tell you that I love Sunday morning better than any other day of the week. I have more energy, more focus, more desire, more drive. We used to have a dog. Her name was Gracie. She was a German shepherd. If you know anything about German shepherds, they're a working breed. If you don't give them something to do, they'll find something to do. <laughs> and we had started walking her the first week. One morning I got up and went in and looked, and she was laying by the front door, had went and got her leash and thrown it on her back. <laughs> That's the way I am on Sunday mornings. When I get up, my leash is already on my back. I'm ready to go. But you know what? We got to get that way on Monday morning as the children of God, and on Tuesday morning as the children of God, and on Wednesday morning as the children of God, and on every day that ends in why. We got to get up and put that leash on our back and say, let's go, God. There's somebody today that's living in darkness that you're going to call out of darkness into your marvelous life. There are people that are lost today, Lord. They're going to be found at the end of the day because I'm going to come in contact with them, and I'm not going to be afraid or embarrassed to share you with them. This is where we are to live as children of God. Real ministry begins when worship ends and we walk out of the doors into a corrupt culture that is condemned by its own sin. But yet God has placed you in the path of someone in the culture that needs to know him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer became a modern day martyr for the cause of Christ, particularly for the way the gospel he preached conf confronted the corrupt government and culture of its day. He was imprisoned by the Nazis by the age of 37, where he would preach in the back of transport vehicles <laughs> to the other people around him. And he would preach as they lay on their cots at night and lead them to Jesus. On April 9, 1945, as they prepped him for the hangman's news, he preached his final sermon. He said, this is for me the end, the beginning of life. He considered the end of this life to be the beginning of his real life in the presence of Jesus. My question is, who will be the Dietrich Bonhoeffers of this generation? In the end game, the culture's condemned, but there's something we can do about it right now. We can show the love of Jesus and share the message of Jesus with courage and with conviction, plundering hell and populating heaven every day. 
as I was sharing this sermon on Friday with the team, T.O. looked at me and said, Pastor, and I've, I've got permission to use this story from the young man himself, and I appreciate that. He said, Caleb was in small group Wednesday night, and Caleb is Pastor Marcus and Shamel's, one of their sons. He was just weeping. I asked him why he was weeping. He said, I'm just concerned about people that don't know Jesus, and I don't want anybody to be lost. And I looked at his mom and dad across the table, and I said, God may have just shown you a glimpse of that boy's future because all it takes is one man or woman, one boy or girl to get the lost on their heart. All it takes is one person that says, I'm not going to let my family die lost. I'm not going to let my friends die lost. All it takes is somebody who will take it to heart. And my question is, will you take it to heart today that it is our responsibility collectively to lead people to the saving knowledge of Jesus? Are you willing to go find somebody and walk by them each day so you can invite them to turn from sin and turn to Jesus? Jesus? Are you willing to rescue somebody that is lost and on their way to an eternity without God? Or do you yourself need to be rescued? Because that's why Jesus came. I want you to stand with me all around the room. I'm going to ask Pastor Blake to come. I'm going to have to get shorter sermons or longer services. I don't know. Longer One person says longer services. <laughs> I've got a neighbor at home behind me that hates me. We've never gotten along. I've tried. He's never liked me since I moved there 20 years ago. We've had run-in after run-in. One day I had to run him off because he started threatening my family. Wrong thing to do. Everybody knows that, right? Okay. All right. And you know what I do every day of my life? I pray for his salvation because I don't even want my mean neighbor to miss heaven. Matter of fact, I hope he's my neighbor there because whatever's between us here won't be there. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? And I pray for his salvation every day. And I'm looking for the one opportunity to be able to be instrumental in that. Because not too long ago, this man who's damaged my property and threatened my family, he fell in his yard. And I was the first one to get to him. And I picked him up, and I saw the tears coming in his eyes. See, I even want him to go to heaven. I want you to look around this room just a moment and see if there's anybody you don't want to see in heaven. Just go ahead. You got my permission. Look all, you may need to look all the way around. There might be somebody behind you. Is there anybody here you don't want to see in heaven? I think the answer is no. I want you to do the same thing when you leave here today. As you look around at the people that rub you, the, oh, God, help us today. God is wanting the church to get a heart for people that don't have a heart for us. Did you hear me? He's wanting us to get a heart for people that don't have a heart for Jesus. They don't have a heart for the church, Christian church. As a matter of fact, they're persecuting the Christian church right now. we got to get a heart for them because there's somebody in that crowd that's going to know Jesus because they ran into you. How many of you are ready to help somebody? You're ready to lead somebody. We all need Jesus, and we are called to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. This series is revealing the end game of the culture, but glory, glory to God, there is victory for us the children and the body of Christ. Heaven is rejoicing for the lives given to Christ today. We praise God for salvations. And if you have any prayer requests, spoken or unspoken, please let us know. GC Online will spring into prayers for you today. Visit our website and click on the prayer and praise button in the right hand corner. Love to join our online campus? Text online to 615-488-7151. What a blessing to worship with each of you today. Go out and shout about Jesus. Souls need need saving. And remember one last thing, God loves you and so does GC Church.